Portana is an awesome free and open source graphical user interface to manage Docker containers on your Linux server. But did you know that you can also use a single Portana instance to manage multiple hosts as well? In this tutorial, I will show you how you can easily connect all your Docker servers to your main Portainer instance and manage them all in one single UI. Let's go! Hey everyone, this is Christian and I create tutorials and content for IT professionals. If you want to learn more about Docker, DevOps processes or how to manage your Linux server, then make sure you are liking this video and also subscribe to the channel. Note in this video I won't explain how to deploy Portainer itself because I already have covered this in a previous video. If you haven't watched it then go and check it out, I've put you a link in the description below. And if you have deployed your Portainer instance you probably have used it to connect to your local Docker instance and manage Docker containers on this local machine. But you can also add other remote servers to manage Docker containers on other machines and you can use your main Portainer instance to manage them all in one centralized space. And this is what we are going to do in this tutorial. And as always you will find a written version of this tutorial on my blog article so you don't need to remember or write down any commands. Just go and have a look in the video description below, click on the link and then you can go to the written blog article and just copy and paste the commands. Okay, so you might have seen in the Portainer UI that when you navigate on your host to the endpoint section you can add new entries here. And you got a few different options there that may seem a bit confusing when you first look at it but don't worry I will explain it to you. So first of all because Portainer is very flexible and can do many things you also have different options to set it up and manage containers in different ways depending on your environment and your requirements. So I've only used Portainer to manage single Docker hosts in the past and this is probably the common use case for most of you guys. But if you want to use Portainer to manage container orchestration tools, there is the Portainer agent which can be deployed in the Docker Swarm cluster and also the last two options that can be used to manage Kubernetes clusters. But in this tutorial we'll be focused on the second and the third button, the Portainer Edge agent and the Docker API to manage remote servers that are running the Docker engine. By the way, I'm also planning to do a video on container orchestration as well in the future because this is something we see more commonly used in the industry, especially in larger environments where you need to deploy containers in a scalable and high available way. So don't worry, stay tuned for upcoming videos about Kubernetes. Okay, so the main two options we have to connect additional Docker hosts or Portainer instance are the Portainer Edge agent and the Docker API. The Docker API is probably the easiest way because it just connects to the Docker socket just like the local instance would do, but the connection itself works over the network. So by exposing the Docker API on your remote hosts to a local or DMZ network, you can allow Portainer to manage these remote servers as well. Okay, so one thing is really important here and I need to emphasize it as much as I can. Exposing the Docker API on the network is relatively easy, but if you're doing this the wrong way, this is also a big security concern. Because if you just expose the API socket to the public internet without any restrictions or any authentication at all, this means you will giving anyone root access to your server. So you get pretty quickly infected by any malicious containers such as malware, crypto miners and other bad things that can infect your server. It's just like leaving your home's door open and anyone can just come in and do what he wants. So if you want to expose the Docker API on your remote servers then make sure you're not doing this on the public internet. Just use an internal cloud network where your servers are located. And if your servers are located somewhere in different networks then use a VPN to securely encrypt and connect those servers. By the way I've also done videos on VPNs like WireGuard. This is relatively easy to set up so go and check out my videos about it. I've put your link in the description below. And also make sure you set up proper TLS encryption and verification for both your server and your clients. But of course this wouldn't be the digital life if I would just leave you alone with this stuff without showing you how to do this. So, so let's also take a look how to set up proper TLS encryption and verification so you can securely connect your Portainer instance to all your remote servers. So before you set up this stuff I would recommend you to read the official instructions on the Docker's homepage under Engine, Security and Protect Access. This will teach you how to generate proper certificates that you can deploy on your remote server and your Portainer instance that makes sure that your connection is encrypted and only a verified client can connect to your remote server and execute Docker instructions. But here's a quick walkthrough what you need to do. 
Okay guys, so I'm now connected to my remote server staging.disrapid.com where I have already deployed the Docker engine and it's already running. And the first thing I want to do is I want to create a new folder in the slash root directory where I want to store the public certs and the private keys that we need to generate to secure and protect the connection between the client and the host. So the first command, the open SSL gen RSA will create a private key for the certificate authority. We also need to give it a secured passphrase without it's not really working. And after we have generated the private key, we can also use it to generate a public CA cert. So therefore I use the open SSL required command. We will set the expiry to one year and we will use the CA key that we have previously generated and output a CA.pem, which is a public cert for our certificate authority. So once this is done, we have stored those two files in the folder and now we can generate a server and a client certificate. This always starts with generating a private key and we're using the same command just without the dash AES 246 just uh, we have used to generate the CA key and we are also using the 4096 bit encryption. So we don't need to set up a passphrase for that and then we also need to generate a certificate sign request so we can actually generate a self-signed certificate. So make sure you are replacing the staging.disrapid.com hostname with your public or FQDN of your remote server where you want to connect your port instance to. And also make sure you're using the server dash key we have just generated and output it as a server.csr which is a certificate sign request. Then we need to add two entries in a configuration file. So the first command will enter a subject alt name. So this is important when you need to verify the public cert of your server. And first we want to use the DNS name, which is staging.disrapid.com. So make sure you're replacing this with your public domain name of your remote server. And you can also add multiple IP addresses here. So the first one is the public IP address of the server when for whatever reason I want to use it to connect to the server. But I also want to use the private IP address that is on my internal cloud network. And we are writing those configuration entries to the extfile.cnf. So the next command is recommended by the Docker's documentation and this will extend the key usage to use it for server authentication. We also want to put this configuration entry in the ext file.cnf and if we cut out the output of this file you can see that both configuration entries are correctly stored there. Now we can generate our self-signed certificate for the server and this is using a pretty long command so you probably don't need to write it down or remember it but it's very important I just want to explain everything to you so you can easily understand and recap what we're doing here but usually you can basically just copy and paste this from my written blog article documentation. So this command will create a self-signed certificate with our previously generated certificate sign request, our certificate authority private key and public cert and we will output it to the server-cert.pem by using our configuration file so this will output a valid self-signed server certificate certificate that is expiring after one year. So we can use this certificate to verify the connection of the server and now we can basically just do the same and generate a client certificate as well. So first start again with creating a private key with the 4096 bit encryption and then create a certificate sign request this time for the client. So make sure you're replacing portainer.thedigitallife.com with your public DNS name of your portainer server and we also want to put the extended key usage to use the client authentication in the self-signed cert. This time we can skip the subject alt name because we don't need to verify it for the client cert. And then we can again create our self-signed certificate for the client as well. It's basically the same command like for the server. It will output a cert.pem which is the public self-signed certificate of the client by using the ext file, the ext file dash client configuration file. Okay, so this was a lot of stuff and we can now safely just remove our sign request because we don't need it anymore. So just delete the client.csr, the server.csr, the ext file configuration files. And we also should protect our private keys because these keys are really, really important. So we should change the permissions to 0400 so that only the root user can only read those private keys. So protect these keys as you would protect your root password because this is what it means. Anyone with this connection and with this private key can basically get root access to your server. So make sure you are securing it and not sharing this with anyone else.
Okay, so we have now generated all we need to actually protect our Docker API and expose it in a secure way. The Docker daemon, by the way, is not exposing it to the network by default, so we need to create a new configuration file that tells the Docker daemon that it should expose the service to the network and also use the certificates that are stored in this location. So first of all, we need to create a new daemon.json configuration file inside the etc. docker folder. And then we start with a bracket and we first need to generate the host names. So the first entry is for the Unix socket. And this is basically just listening on a Unix socket. This is the default of the Docker daemon. But now we also need to add a TCP socket. So that will make the Docker daemon listening for incoming network connections with the TCP protocol as well. And most tutorials will actually tell you that you can insert the 0.0.0.0 IP address, which is basically listening on all available interface IP addresses this server has. And this will expose the Docker API to all incoming connections. So when you want to restrict this, for example, just for an internal network, you should use the internal IP address of your server. No one from the public internet can connect to it. Only any network hosts inside my private cloud network could connect to this socket. We also want to expose the port 2376, which stands for the encrypted version. And we're going to enable TLS, which is the encryption, and the TLS CA certs, uh, which is the public certificate of the certificate authority. And then we are also inserting our server public search and the server's private key that we need to decrypt the packets from the clients. And we also want to enable the TLS verify true. So the TLS verify setting is really important to verify the client because without the setting, we probably would just encrypt the connection, but we wouldn't verify if the client is already permitted to access our server. So this is only enabled by this setting. So all this stuff is really important. So when you now restart your Docker daemon, you will get an error message. And it took me quite a while to look it up, but it's clearly mentioned in the Docker documentation. We need to actually create a workaround to make this working. So just create a new folder in the system D that overrides the default configuration for the Docker daemon service. And then just add these three configuration lines inside this file, which will enable the Docker daemon to use our daemon.json configuration file. So after this, it's very important that you also access execute the systemd daemon reload command otherwise the docker daemon will continue to fail at the starting and then after we have set up this you can securely start your docker service it should just be up and running and if we execute an ssltup command which will show us the listening ports on our remote server we can see that the docker daemon is now running and listening for incoming tcp connections but only on the internal ip address on port 2376 so now on the port in your UI, we can add a new endpoint here using the directly connect to the Docker API option. And then we will give it a name. I will just use the public DNS name of our remote server. And then we want to enter the private IP address or the IP address of the internal cloud network where we want to connect from our port in our instance to. And I've done a small mistake here. I'm using the 2375 port, which is sometimes used in some public documentations, but the 23 375 port is the unencrypted port and remember we are listening on the 2376 port so we will later see an error message here so make sure you're putting the correct url in here and then we enter our tls with server and client verification so you could in theory also use other options here but they are less secure so we will use the first option for the most security and you no need to download the public certificate of your certificate authority the tls certificate and key of the client i've done this via scp you can basically just copy these three files and insert them in the configuration so now we will get an error message fail to communicate with the endpoint because i've used the wrong port and after correcting this we can actually see that we have now connected to our remote server and when you click on home you should see a second endpoint here that you can select so the first one is our local instance we are just connecting to the local unix socket and the second one is our exposed docker api remote server so now we have successfully added another endpoint and when we click on this we can now manage our remote server from our main port and instance just like local server awesome right
Okay, so I hope this helped you to understand how you can add additional Docker hosts to your main Portainer instance and manage them all in a centralized approach. Of course, all these Docker hosts are still independent from each other, so we actually cannot really scale containers or move them around different server hosts. But this is something we're going to take a look. I have previously teasered it in the beginning of this video because this is something where we will use Kubernetes to create high available clusters for all our Docker containers. And this is commonly used in the IT industry as well, especially in large environments and cloud environments as well. So this will be very interesting. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you're liking this and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos and tutorials for IT professionals. So thanks everybody for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care of yourself and I hope I see you soon. Bye bye.